Hi ladies, it's so good to be back together with you. My name is Natalie Mackey and this is my fourth year at Mothers Together and my third year on the teaching team. I have been married to my husband Pete for the last 11 years and we have two little nuggets, Penny who's five and Tad who we still call baby Tad but he's two and a half. And uh, we have 16 chickens and two what I like to call involuntary quarantine bunnies that were gifted to us. And last but not least, one dog, Sam. So, wow, what a time in our world right now. We're in the midst of a global pandemic, economic uncertainty, and as a nation, we are wrestling with deep entrenched wounds that have been a part of the fabric of our society since its founding. Many of us have lost jobs. We're figuring out how to homeschool for the first time. We're nervous for friends and loved ones with this virus, and it can often feel like a lot. Um, that's just the half of it, right? And that's why I'm so excited to be here diving into the book of Isaiah with you today. Romans 10, 14 says, happy are the feet who bring good news. And that's how I feel. My feet are happy because I'm bringing the good news this morning as we enter into the incredible goodness that God has for us for in his word and in studying the book of Isaiah in particular. That's our theme for this year. Our theme is the best news ever. It's so cool how to see how the Lord always goes ahead and prepares the hearts of the teaching team with the word that he wants to bring for this year, well before we have any idea what we're going to need when the time comes. And this year, he has gone ahead of us and put the book of Isaiah on our hearts. And we need some good news, but we don't have just good news. We have the best news ever. Our theme verse is Isaiah 57 too. How beautiful are the feet on the mountains of those who bring good news. So grab a bottomless cup of coffee, which you've probably microwaved five times like I do throughout the day, and let's see what the Lord has for us. I'm going to pray for our time together. Lord, you say in this book that we are about to study in Isaiah 40 that the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our Lord stands forever. And in Isaiah 55, you promise that your word will never return void. You will send it out and it always produces fruit. It will accomplish all you want it to, and it will prosper everywhere you send it. Lord, we invite you in our time together. Open our ears to hear and our eyes to see your goodness in the land of the living. Bless our time. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay, so this week we are kicking off um, the, our introductory study in the book of Isaiah. So we're going to do an overview, and we're going to talk a little bit about the book's authorship, historical context, some notable verses, and most importantly, our central idea for today, which is behold the preciousness of Jesus. Behold the preciousness of Jesus. In every single book of the Old Testament, we see this foreshadowing of Jesus, of the gift of Jesus. Story after story tells of our need for a savior and the sin that took resident, up residence in the heart of man after the fall of Adam and Eve. The wickedness and sin so rampant in our world right now cries out for a savior. It is only as we contemplate our own sin and we bear witness to the ravaging effects of sin in the lives of those we love and in the world at large that we begin to contemplate how much and how deeply and how desperately we need Jesus. As early as Genesis 3, which is the chapter right after the fall of man, God says, don't worry, I knew this was going to happen and I have a secret rescue plan for you. I will purchase you back at great cost to myself. As the Jesus Storybooks the Bible puts it, he will suffer, but he will win. In Isaiah, we see the clearest Old Testament picture of Christ as Isaiah prophesies in granular detail about the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, Emmanuel, God with us. Isaiah 53 magnificently describes Jesus long before his birth, saying this, there was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with the bitterest grief, yet it was our weakness he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. He was wounded and crushed for our sins. He was beaten that we might have peace. He was whipped and we were healed. As you make your way through the book of Isaiah, I want you to contemplate the preciousness of Jesus, the fact that he freely gives us all his love, grace, and mercy. 
One of the commentaries I was reading put it this way. God's solution to the cruelty and oppression of the world is not more to be more cruel and oppressive, but to take cruelty and oppression into himself and give back love. This is ultimate power. Isaiah 55 says this, is anyone thirsty? Come and drink, even if you have no money. Come and take your choice of wine or milk. It is all free. Listen, and I will tell you where to get food that is good for your soul. Come to me with your ears wide open. Listen, for the life of your soul is at stake. Listen, for the life of your soul is at stake. So let's open up our Bibles and turn to Isaiah 1. It's right after, um, it's right after Proverbs and right before Song of Solomon. And we're going to just answer some introductory questions about the book. First of all, who is Isaiah? Isaiah was so cool. If you want to put anybody on your hero list, put this guy on here. He, he had courage like you wouldn't believe. His name means, the name Isaiah means, the Lord is my salvation. And he prophesied during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. They were all kings of Judah during the last half of the 8th century B.C., So many scholars think that Isaiah himself was a member of the royal family because of his literary prowess, and he seemed to have regular access to the kings of Judah, so they thought that perhaps he's a member of the royal family also. Um, He was a man who encountered, encountered God in a radical way, and those encounters transformed him forever. This week, I want you to read Isaiah chapter 6, and it's the story of Isaiah's cleansing and call to be the Lord's prophet. As you read, I want you to imagine encountering the Lord the way Isaiah encountered him, encountered him. And Isaiah had absolutely no fear of man. He cared only for obedience for the Lord, so much so that in chapter 20, the Lord says this to him as, one of, as part of one of his messages to the people of Israel. And he says, take off all your clothes, Isaiah, including your sandals. Isaiah did as he was told and walked around naked and barefoot for three years. He didn't hem and haw when the Lord told him to do something. He was a courageous man who obeyed the Lord. I bet you're all thinking, I can figure out what happened in chapter 20, right? Well, go check it out. Anyway, it's a very exciting book. Lots of unexpected things happen. Um, Now you might be thinking, okay, this is Isaiah, but what is a book of prophecy? And there are several books of prophecy throughout the Bible, mostly in the Old Testament. In its simplest form, a book of prophecy means that a particular person received a message inspired by God that often foretold the future and God's plans for the nature of or the nation of Israel and for humanity at large. In Isaiah 48, God explains why he uses prophecy, saying, I know how stubborn and obstinate you are. Your necks are as unbending as iron. You are as hard-headed as bronze. That is why I told you ahead of time what I was going to do. That way you could never say, my idol did it. I have, you have heard the predictions and seen them fulfilled. So you cannot say, we knew all the time. The NIV application commentary put it this way. It says, when creation has lost its way, seeking its own glory, and in so doing, ensuring its own destruction, it is only the creator of the system who can redeem the system. And that is what Jesus is, or God is telling us all about throughout the book of Isaiah, how he is sending Jesus as the creator of the system to redeem the system. Uh, biblical books of prophecy include God's messages to his people about their sin and rebellion and idolatry. They call for repentance and restoration. The Lord wants wholeness in the people of Israel's walk with him. I don't want you to be intimidated by studying a book of prophecy. I love a good vocabulary word, but in one of the commentaries I was reading, I felt like I had to look up 10 words every paragraph. But we would do well to remember this year with Jen Wilkins' excellent advice. She says, the heart cannot know, cannot, the heart cannot love what the mind does not know. So if our minds don't engage with scripture and try to understand it and wrestle with it, then our hearts can't truly love God because his revealed word is where he says the most about who he is and how much he loves us. So we have an opportunity this year to love the Lord with our minds in a deep way, and we will be richly rewarded in pursuing him with our minds as we study the book of Isaiah. Our next question is, what was happening in the world when Isaiah was prophesying? We talked a little bit about how the world is topsy-turvy right now, but the good news is that everything was topsy-turvy then even more so. But the word of the Lord stands firm forever. 
During the time that Isaiah was writing, the tiny nation of Israel was split into two kingdoms. It was surrounded by hostile enemies and huge empires. It was constantly being threatened by invasion or unholy alliances. Assyria and Babylon threatened to the north. And then Egypt, who was sometimes friend, sometimes foe, was lurking on the southern borders. Wicked kings promoted injustice and idolatry, even the worship of the idol Moloch, who required child sacrifice. The heart of God was deeply grieved and angered by all that was happening in the world during this time. And that's why there's so much about sin and judgment in the book of Isaiah. If you have a moment, I want you to check out chapter 59, warnings against sin. And God says, they spend their time and energy spinning evil plans that end up in deadly actions. Their feet run to do evil and they rush to commit murder. They think only about sinning. They do not know what true peace is or what it means to do good or be just. And later Isaiah says of them, well, no wonder we are in darkness when we expected light. No wonder we are walking in the gloom. Truly, like Romans 6, 23 says, the wages of sin is death. But the the last part of that verse is the gift of God is eternal life. Judgment and sin are never the last word with our God. He is merciful and loving. And even though we may suffer the ugly consequences of our sin, he and rebellion, he longs to redeem us and restore us to himself. And in Isaiah, he promises to do exactly that through Jesus. Um, next, we're going to talk about what is the structure of the book and what are some key themes. So among scholars of antiquity, this book is universally revered for its literary qualities and its historical record. And as you read the beautiful poetry and prose, I think you're going to agree. It's so lovely. And like the Bible, Isaiah is divided into two portions. The Bible is divided into the Old Testament and the New Testament. And Isaiah is is pretty easily divided into chapters 1 through 39 and then 40 through 66. And also, like the Bible, it has 66 chapters and the Bible has 66 books. And uh, furthermore, the first 37, 39 chapters of Isaiah deal a lot with sin and judgment. And chapters 40 through 66 begin to talk about the promises of Jesus and the hope and the love and the restoration that God has for his people. Um, And also, like the Bible, Isaiah tells the overall story of our life with God. He talks about creation and fall and sin and ultimately reconciliation through the sacrifice of Jesus. So you'll notice in chapters 1 through 37 that Isaiah often refers to the king who reigns in Zion. Sometimes he's talking about the current reigning king of Judah. Sometimes he's talking about the Lord God as king. And sometimes he's talking about the future king, Jesus. So other main themes in the book include uh, servanthood and kingdom, trust and rebellion, arrogance and humiliation, and the uniqueness of Yahweh as Lord. And Isaiah explores these themes. The basis for his accusation of sin against the people of Israel are the Sinai covenant. And you might be thinking, what is the Sinai Covenant? It isn't explicitly mentioned, but it is everywhere assumed in the book of Isaiah. It is, in its most basic sense, a covenant is a solemn promise to engage in or refrain from uh, specified action. So it is rooted in law, and it's very binding in a legal sense. The Bible contains a few such covenants, such as the Sinai Covenant or the Davidic Covenant and the Mosaic Covenant, sometimes it's called. And um, they're all listed in the first five books of the Bible. And this is where God establishes his very special relationship with the people of Israel. They are called to worship him only. They're supposed to be set apart from the people who practice idol worship. And much of Isaiah's prophecy is condemning the people of Israel because they've broken their covenant promises to God. They are living in wickedness and idolatry and harlotry, and they are putting their faith and trust in everything and everyone but God, and they are refusing to obey any of his laws in open rebellion. So when did Isaiah write, and when and where were his prophecies fulfilled? As we mentioned before, Isaiah wrote in the last half of the 8th century BC. He foretold of the rise and fall of Assyria and also the rise and fall of Babylon and the exile of the Jewish people to Babylon for a period of 70 years. And Isaiah foretold how the Assyrian and Babylonian empires would threaten Israel and ultimately Babylon would capture and conquer them. And the ancient empires of of Babylon and Assyria were located near modern day Iraq. Isaiah also predicted the return of the nation of Israel after that 70 years of exile back to their land to rebuild the temple. And this is the temple 
that, and they were rebuilding the temple under the reign of this, the, uh, sorry, Cyrus of Persia. And this is the temple that would have been in existence when Jesus was alive. But there is, so there's some scholarly discussion about the book of Isaiah and whether or not it was written by multiple authors. But both of the commentaries that I consulted about this ultimately rejected that. And they just said, let's go with the text. And the text says, this is written by Isaiah, son of Amos. But the reason, which I thought was pretty interesting, why they're rejecting it is because a lot of scholars, there are a lot of, interestingly, biblical scholars who wouldn't necessarily um, believe that the word is holy and inspired by God, but they, they have a hard time understanding that God and his prophets can foretell the future. And so what happened is that Cyrus is is named in the book of Isaiah and Isaiah prophesied about exactly how he would help the people of Israel and exactly what he would do more than 150 years before Cyrus's birth. And so some scholars said, oh, that can't possibly be, ha-, you know, it can't possibly be true. They must have written it over a long period of time, but there's actually very little historical evidence to support that or basis for it. But um, what's cool is we believe in a God who can do anything. And so if we believe in a God who can do anything, um, then we believe in prophecy and that God can tell people the future ahead of time. So um, the messianic prophecies are the prophecies that are relating to the specifics of Jesus and his birth and where he's born and, and details about his life were obviously fulfilled during his lifetime and afterward. Um, and our last question together is, how does the book of Isaiah tie into what we've been studying over the last few years at Mothers Together. So since I've been here, we've studied the book of Genesis, Ephesians, and Mark. Do you remember last year we talked in our kickoff about John the Baptist? In the book of Mark, one of the four gospels of Jesus, it begins with this. It says, listen, I hear the voice of someone shouting, make a highway for the Lord through the wilderness. Make a straight, smooth road through the desert for God. Uh, That scripture is from Isaiah 40. So hundreds of years before John the Baptist came to make a highway for the Lord through the wilderness with his ministry to prepare the people of Israel for the coming of Jesus, Isaiah wrote these exact words about him, which were then fulfilled at the proper time. So a few minutes ago, I mentioned Isaiah 53. I want you to spend some time in this chapter this week thinking about what we learned about the life of Jesus last year in Mark and what Isaiah prophesied about Jesus in Isaiah 53. I just want to tell you that as I've been studying this book over the summer, the Lord has so much wonderful treasure for us this year in the book of Isaiah. It's near and dear to my heart. When I was pregnant with my daughter Penny and I was struggling with fear and anxiety, the Lord gave me this verse from Isaiah 26, 3 through 4. It was the bedrock of that season of life. He says, He will keep in perfect peace her whose heart is steadfast because she trusts in Him. Trust in the Lord your God, for the Lord, the Lord, is the rock eternal. In closing, as we contemplate the preciousness of Jesus until we have the time, opportunity to meet together again, I want you, I want to leave you with this excerpt from the Jesus Storybook Bible, because children's Bibles so often put it more eloquently, uh, they put the heart of the matter so eloquently. So this is what it says about Isaiah. Dear little flock, you're all wandering away from me like sheep in an open field. You have always been running away from me, and now you're lost. You can't find your way back. But I can't stop loving you. I will come to find you. So I'm sending a shepherd to look after you and love you. Yes, someone is going to come and rescue you. But he won't be anyone who you expect. He will be a king, but he won't live in a palace, and he won't have lots of money. He will be poor, and he will be a servant. But this king will heal the whole world. It's the secret rescue plan we made from before the beginning of the world. It's the only way to get you back. And one day, when he comes to rule forever, the mountains and the trees will dance and sing with joy. Everything sad will come untrue. I promise. So bless you this week, dear ladies, and I look forward to diving into Isaiah 1 and 2 together soon.